Good night, good afternoon, or good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to this third day of the TAUP 2021 International Conference. Today we are having our cosmology, cosmology plenary session. It's a great pleasure to have Richard Easter from the University of Auckland as our first speaker, who will tell, tell us about inflation. I would like to, to deeply encourage all the participants to submit their questions through the forums uh, in the virtual environment of the conference. So Richard, whenever you would like, uh, you can start your talk and... Uh, uh -huh. uh, here we go, starting video and screen sharing. Thank you very much. And hang on a minute. Uh, here we go. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to really thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to this. Um, it came with an invitation, including a, 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 um, a, a, a link to a New York Times article on, the, on um, how beautiful uh, Valencia was. Um, and, and I would love to be there in person, but I'm also grateful that I can um, that I can participate remotely. It's a, it's a strange time, and, and it's good to see that our um, community is making the best of it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the status of inflation. Uh, I was going to say this evening, um, but but in fact uh, this morning. Um, and so I, should, I just start by, by noting that I'm literally almost exactly as far from um, from from the venue or the nominal venue of this conference as it's possible to get. Um, Spain is is, the, is close to the antipodal point of um, New Zealand, so you have saved me 48 hours in an aircraft um, and also 7.2 tons of carbon. Um, but on the downside, I don't get to see um, to see my colleagues in person. Um, I want to start by very briefly um, reminding us you know, why it is that inflation matters or all the problems that is that inflation solves. And so it's, you know, it's noteworthy that this year is technically the 40th birthday of inflation uh, since um, the paper that first described inflation um, appeared in print, although the idea itself um, uh, um, um, dates back uh, earlier, both in terms of when Guth actually had it, but also that there's... Um, a sort of precursor literature um, that describes ideas that, that, that with the benefit of hindsight, uh, look very similar to inflation. But it's worth noting that the, the visible universe is about 40 billion um, light years across. Um, and so that includes about, a, you know, the universe is just under 14 billion years old, but there's a factor of three added to that um, because the distant parts of the universe have moved away from us uh, since light was emitted from them. Um, and so in Planck lengths, that's about two times 10 to the 61 Planck lengths. So on the other hand, if we look at uh, um, 2.7 or three degree um, uh, uh, or three Kelvin um, black body, um, that peaks at 160.4 gigahertz and a photon energy um, in that range um, is a, a sort of much less than an electron volt. And so we know that photons redshift as the universe grows and um, so the universe then cools as it expands. And uh, the um, black body distribution is such that its, its temperature is proportional to the peak wavelength. So the no, inversely proportional to the, to the peak wavelength. Is that right? No, no, no. Temperature goes down as wavelength goes up. That, um, so, but as, as the universe expands, the, um, the temperature drops in inverse um, proportion to the size of the universe. And so the Planck energy is about 10 to the 19 electron volts, uh, sorry, giga electron volts. And so if we ask, you know, how much does the universe need to expand um, or how much has the universe expanded since it was at the Planck temperature? If we just naively assume that this, um, you know, that the microwave background is, um, you know, is, is the thing that sets the temperature going back into the past, uh, then we get a total growth of about ten to the thirty, and ten to the thirty is a very different number um, from ten to the sixty, and so we can assume that um, and if the initial state of the universe was Planckian, both in size and in temperature or energy then this mismatch of about 10 to the 30 is solved by inflation. And so if we have a period in the um, early universe, because we know that it can't happen more recently, you know, just because it would uh, contradict observations. Um, in the early universe, um, if the universe grows by about a factor of 10 to the 30, while at roughly constant density, uh, which is to say in something close uh, to a Decida universe, but not exactly Decida, um, then that, um, that will solve that discrepancy. It will make those two numbers match. 
And so that is inflation or anything, in fact, that um, decouples those two numbers will, will serve to solve this problem. But inflation uh, famously is the thing that addresses that problem for us. So this leads us to an understanding of a universe that looks like this. Um, and uh, Leecha is speaking immediately after me and she's obviously one of the um, uh, pe people who, um, who did a huge amount of work on WMAP. So it's um, this, um, this beautiful diagram um, you know, describes the, um, the process of looking back um, into the universe, uh, to the microwave background and beyond to the inflationary phase. Um, and um, in particular, we've got a range of epochs here. So we have, um, you know, structure formation and stars, which is dominated both by baryonic physics, which we think we do understand, although it's hard to model, um, and the physics of the dark sector, which we can infer, but we don't um, understand. Uh, the microwave background is something that we understand well and is related largely to the physics of atoms, um, which you know, are well understood both theoretically and experimentally. Uh, we can go back to the nuclear synthesis phase. Again, that's something we have fairly good control over. It leaves um, you know, visible impact in the universe today, but the inflationary phase is represented by this period of ex exponential growth that then sets the initial conditions through these quantum fluctuations that gets written um, both into the microwave background, but also seeds the um, structure formation that, um, that we see in this, in this phase. But inflation is the odd one out of these things, and that inflation is the only phase in this kind of... Um, you know, shorthand history of the universe. That is um, something where we, you know, in the case of dark energy, we've got, um, you know, we can watch the way the universe expands. We can make quite detailed calculations. In the case of inflation, it relies on both um, physics that is necessarily beyond the standard model because nothing in the standard model will support uh, this period of accelerated expansion. Um, and also it's purely inferential in that we can't be certain that this is a phase um, that actually exists. Whereas the present day acceleration of the universe is something that we can be quite um, that we can be quite confident about. So that said, um, it's kind of remarkable that something that is um, that inferential and remains that inferential after um, forty years um, has become part of the accepted, um, well, very much become part of the accepted uh, history of the universe. And in many ways, the reason that is is that inflation. Um, has been surprising or was surprisingly successful in predicting a whole set of numbers that hadn't been um, in some cases uh, measured at all. In other cases, their values weren't well understood. And so if we look at the scorecard for inflation um, and we look at what it is that inflation models uh, routinely predict, we see that the universe is now known uh, to be spatially flat uh, to very high precision, which was something that was not previously known. Uh, we predict a near scale invariant perturbation, uh, spectrum of perturbations, not exactly scale invariant, but close to. Um, and so that's the very broken scale invariance is measured by this parameter here, which is close to zero. The perturbations that are laid down are Gaussian to parts in 10,000, maybe. This FNL parameter is, um, you know, once, once the perturbations um, look like the original perturbation squared. Uh, then this uh, parameter is on order one and the original perturbations are very small. So an FNL of one is a very small amount of non-Gaussianity. Uh, adiabatic in the um, sense that the, the um, perturbations appear to, uh, to follow a kind of single path um, and we don't see any evidence for topological defects. And so this work, these numbers are, are lifted directly from the Planck um, reviews uh, uh, from 2018, which is still, um, there's been some progress since then, but it still represents a, the sort of the, the state of state of the art for our understanding of inflation. So we have this idea that um, inflation is this period of exponential expansion in the early universe. And we can characterize a simple inflationary models uh, through a potential uh, V of phi, where phi is some scalar field. And so this may be an urgent potential that comes you know, out of some uh, you know, complex um, state that has some effective scalar degree of freedom, or it may be something that we see in the Lagrangian you know, of some complicated theory. But we can characterize the shape of this potential through what is known as the slow roll parameters, where these primes uh, simply met, um, uh, derivatives of the potential with respect to phi. And we can um, look at the minimal set of observables um, that we can see um, in cosmology. And so the spectrum of the perturbations, um, well, again, uh, so this is um, uh, the 
the whether or not the, the long wavelengths or the short wavelengths uh, primordial perturbations are slightly larger than each other. A red spectrum says that obviously the longer wavelengths perturbations are going to be slightly dominant. Um, and so these numbers here are typically um, on the order of um, 0.01. And so this quantity is typically a little close to one, which is the scale invariant case, but in practice, uh, we've measured it to be a little bit less. And the other parameter that inflation can produce, is, as most people will have heard, is a global background of gravitational waves. So something like the microwave background, but a stochastic um, a background of gravitational waves that is characterized by this parameter R. And so the interesting thing about R is that it depends um, overall on this epsilon parameter, which we see up here, which is related to the slope of the potential, um, whereas eta is related to the, um, to the second derivative. And finally, the running here is, um, is given by this expression um, and in higher order terms um, off, um, off to the right that, it, that I've left out. So we can compare our ability to measure these quantities and we can use that to put constraints on what um, possible inflationary models uh, can be responsible for what it is that we see uh, when we look into the sky. And so these numbers have been constrained. So we already say, given uh, the quality of the data that we have today, that the constraints on epsilon, the slope, mean that it has to be a lot smaller in some dimensional set of units than this measure of, um, of the second derivative. So it looks like, that the second derivative is negative and we're sitting in a region of the potential where um, the second derivative is much larger than the slope in other words close um, to, to a local maximum and this has led to the existence of plots like this that go by the name of the zoo plot um, and this is the uh, marginalized um, likelihood mentioned not just the plank data but also um, uh, the bicep and kick um, data on the um, microwave background that has constrained this um, joint parameter space and different inflationary models pick out different um, different chunks of this parameter space. Possibly the most noticeable thing is that a lot of the models that um, we might once have looked at lie outside of the um, joint um, uh, likelihood contours uh, for these experiments. So we're starting to, or not starting, we have ruled out a large number of what looked like previously viable and reasonable um, inflationary models on the basis of this data. So we're, um, it's actually noteworthy that in 1990, so we're taking a you know, somewhat historical um, picture here, uh, the first book on inflation came out and it was while I was a graduate student. And the most striking thing to me in this is that most of the models in this book are now known to be wrong. The models of inflation that this describes, it talks about the first chapter of the book, uh, looks at one model in, in detail. And that model was, in fact, uh, the Lambda Phi 4 model was ruled out by the first, um, or, or certainly strongly constrained, and is now firmly ruled out, I think, uh, from memory by the first year of WMAP data. So the idea. Um, that we could look at gut scale physics, physics that would be happening at the grand unified scale. We could confront it with data um, and data wins. Those, those models, um, models that looked look viable are no longer, um, you know, no longer things that can account uh, for what we see in the sky. And so there's real progress being made here, even if it's of a slightly negative kind in the sense that, um, you know, scenarios are being eliminated. I'm likewise not a huge fan of um, bibliometrics, but since we're looking back into the past, it's worth noting that um, that the paper that uh, late, no, the um, proposed inflation uh, written in 1981, um, you can see that you know it was an immediate hit. That people were working on this um, through the 80s and 90s, but in 2003, you see the sudden inflection in the amount of interest um, in inflation from the community as a whole. And you also see this um, spike here in 2014 that I'll, I'll come back to um, a little later on. But the challenge for us is, is to actually prove that inflation happened rather than um, to, um, you know, to, to hope that it happened or to think that it might have happened. And so the challenge is that only one of the numbers that describes the inflationary potential is unambiguously non-zero. For the rest of those things, we're in some sense measuring zero. And so one of the challenges with that is, you know, we don't know, um, you know, how, more, how much more accurately we might have to measure those parameters uh, before we can make um, a definitive detection. So there's not a lot of non-trivial information about this inflationary phase if everything comes back down to the single number. The interesting thing 
about the gravitational wave background is that this is often presented as a smoking gun of inflation. Uh, the amplitude um, scales directly with the value of the potential during inflation. So the energy scale, the density of the universe during inflation, uh, the amplitude of this gravitational wave background is essentially um, uh, sc scaling with this, um, with this value. Um, simple inflationary models um, have an energy scale of about 10 to the 16 GeV. So that's about a trillion uh, LHCs or thereabouts. Um, and so that um, allows us to specify the, what we call the tensor scalar ratio. And the scalar ratio or scalar quantity is just the amplitude of the temperature anisotropies in the microwave background. So that's a measured number. It's about 10 to the minus 5. And the fact that we've measured R to be less then maybe 0.06 is simply uh, specifying the ratio of the tensor perturbations uh, relative to their primordial um, scalar or, or density perturbations that are the ones that actually see uh, the galaxies and the uh, um, signals that we see in the microwave background. So the, much of the future or much of the future focus on being able to test inflation is focused on being able to put tighter and tighter constraints on the parameter R or alternatively, um, being able to detect it at lower and lower levels. The challenge is, is that as you lower the inflationary energy scale by a little bit, the uh, um, scale, the value of R uh, drops by a lot. So even if you measure R, you know, um, several orders more, uh, several orders of magnitude more accurately than we have at the moment, uh, then your ability to constrain the total energy scale of inflation um, is still, it's still going to have to be a relatively large energy close to the gut scale, maybe an order of magnitude or two below uh, for it to, it to produce um, a detectable signal. And so this plot here is taken from um, the Astro 2020 white paper on uh, the future of CMB polarization. And again, it shows the kind of uh, thinking and targets that um, the community is looking at for the um, for the coming decade. Um, it's worth noticing that there are going to be massive improvements in our ability to um, to measure R. Um, the combination of Planck and the BICEP and the Keck data, um, you know, gave us uh, very strong constraints. Um, but ground-based observatories over the coming decade are looking at um, measuring R down to you know 0.01 um, or even parts in um, ten to the three. Uh, on the other hand, um, space-based um, observatories, so Lightbird has been, as I understand it, funded by Japan and uh, aims to measure R to within better than um, uh, 10 to the minus 3, uh, whereas the PICO proposal um, talks about being able to make a five-segment detection at um, a level of 5 times 10 to the minus 4, and it's also um, a CMB experiment. Is also part of the ESA Voyage uh, 2050 roadmap, again, as, um, as I understand it from New Zealand. So the mission, the message to take away from this is over the coming um, decade in the case of ground-based uh, ground or probably closer to two decades in the case of um, uh, space-based developments, uh, there will be um, or there are viable technology roadmaps that will really put tight constraints on, um, on the parameter R. My own personal take on this is that our focus on R is a smoking gun test of inflation is to some extent a historical accident. Uh, the tensor amplitude is very easy to calculate. In fact, it was calculated, I think, really before inflation itself um, was proposed, as it turns out. Um, and it's possible to make arguments that both large R and small R models are the sort of natural models in the context of inflation. Um, and when it's also worth noticing that we're, you know, a trillion times beyond the range of current um, terrestrial experimentation. Um, and it's also, you know, we, we believed in 2014 for a brief shining moment that that spike in that citation graph that, um, you know, that we had discovered the signal. Uh, it turns out that what had actually been discovered was dust in the Milky Way. But to some extent, um, you know, this represented a kind of the equivalent of a LIGO um, signal injection into the theory community. And that there were hundreds of papers written um, in the month or two afterwards where it looked like this idea might be viable uh, to explain this very large value of R. But equally now, it seems that people are, you know, can comfortably accommodate a small value of R. So there's no, there's no consensus as to what this should be. Um, so it does look like we're rolling off a hilltop as far as the inflationary potential is concerned. Um, it's also worth noting that um, the string community has spent a lot of effort developing um, what they consider or what are considered to be more uh, realistic models from a stringy perspective, including scenarios that have large values of R. Um, but it does appear and appears increasingly likely that, um, that even though nature may be able to make 
um, a universe with a large R using string theory, um, she, she's chosen not to. Um, most recently, there's been a lot of focus on the alpha attractor models, which um, more naturally fit a smaller values of R. Um, this uh, stringy swampland, uh, again, um, put if you take the swampland hypothesis seriously, constrain uh, the slight shape of the uh, inflationary potential. And a lot of reason, recent um, effort has also gone into seeing whether the um, perturbation spectrum at small scales will be large enough uh, to produce uh, primordial black holes, which has been driven by the, um, the, particularly by the large black holes that have been seen um, by the LIGO collaboration. Uh, where or not inflation happened at all is still very much a, um, a, a, an open debate. Um, and so this was something that kind of you know, reared inside the community um, uh, um, a few years ago. Um, and in particular, this debate um, often depends on, on how, what inference do we draw from, from the inability to, to perceive gravitational waves? Is this something that really, um, that the theory is kind of obliged to produce? Um, or is this something that would be nice to have, but, but, but we're not guaranteed? And, and you know, many, um, you don't necessarily need a smoking gun um, to get a conviction in court. Um, and so it may be that we have to um, rely on circumstantial evidence to, um, to draw inferences about the question. I just want to um, mention um, uh, very briefly or, um, the other question about or the other thing that comes up with inflation is inflation happens potentially at 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 GeV, so just a few orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. We only really have control over what's going on in the universe, maybe at temperatures of a GeV or a few GeV, maybe a TV if we're looking at, um, you know, saying we understand physics up to the um, uh, LHC scale. And so there's this long period of um, expansion after inflation. As the universe goes from having an you know, energy density of 10 to the 16 GeV uh, down to a GeV or a GeV. So the universe can grow um, maybe 10 to the 16, 16 times larger um, in the so-called primordial dark age. Uh, we don't know the laws of physics that apply through most of this time. Um, and it's a much larger period of growth than the 10 to the 5 or so that we've seen since matter radiation equality, which produces you know, everything uh, that we can see in the um, universe today. So even though it's a trillionth of a second, uh, the dominant timescales are such that there's time for complex dynamics to take place um, in this phase. And also we need this phase to somehow be responsible for baryogenesis um, and for the production of dark matter, we assume. So immediately after inflation, uh, the universe is most likely close to a vacuum state. It's dominated by um, a coherently oscillating condensate. So it's devoid of particles um, and either resonance, a resonant production of particles, or a gravitational breakdown of the condensate causes this um, condensate to, to fragment um, and to render the early universe inhomogeneous. So the one, uh, one thing that I think is an interesting um, thing on the horizon for inflation and for early universe physics in general um, is the study of high frequency gravitational radiation. So this is above kilohertz frequencies. So there are no known sources, obviously with sufficient intensity. Um, you know, if you pick up a, you know, if, um, you know, a rock and you, you wave it at a frequency of a few kilohertz, then it will produce gravitational radiation as you, you know, as you oscillate it, um, you know, appropriately, but it's not, um, it's not going to be an easily detectable signal. So if you um, conduct a search for a background of gravitational waves in this frequency, then the only possible source of gravitational waves that we can think of uh, would be unknown physics that applied in very early universe at scales above the TP scale. Um, there are huge technical challenges with developing detectors for this, but I also think um, potentially a fairly open opportunity um, given the difficulty of finding other probes at the very early universe. So any nonlinear process, any process in which the matter density of the, of the early universe is, um, is significantly inhomogeneous, uh, has the potential to produce gravitational radiation. Um, also, this has been piqued by the um, potential interest in primordial black holes because they would imply um, that there was collapse. Uh, not that the collapse itself necessarily produces gravitational waves, but it would imply that the early universe uh, was a lumpy and inhomogeneous place. And so on very large scales, we know that the universe is smooth, but that's entirely consistent uh, with the universe being highly inhomogeneous on scales corresponding to the size of the horizon at the end of inflation, which may literally be you know, a space um, that, you know, that, that would fit in your hand. 
Uh, so they're just a sketch of um, some some work that's going on. There's um, so, some uh, group um, based out of um, uh, Cambridge, and there's been a recent meeting in Trieste, um, and a paper that, or a kind of a summary paper that was written on the basis of that work uh, that looks at the ways that you can focus on um, uh, frequent you know frequencies beyond those that we see from neutron star mergers, and a variety of mechanisms that would produce those um, in the early universe that are potentially constrainable, and you can see going up potential into very, very high frequencies uh, of uh, gravitational radiation. All of these things uh, have the ability to provide um, insight into what the early universe might be doing. Um, the one other thing I wanted to talk about um, very quickly, and this is a chance maybe to, to, to sell a little bit of my own work, is that um, right after or immediately after inflation, the universe is full of, of quantum matter. Um, so, so you know, the excitation of some scalar field. Um, on the other hand, the physics is locally Newtonian. So the physics, the universe in this phase, at least locally, obeys um, the Schrodinger Poisson equation, where you have local Newtonian gravity, um, but you have matter that's described by a wave function, non-relativistic matter that's described by a wave function, so by the Schrodinger equation. Um, if you add self-interactions, then you get the gross Pitiewski equation, um, but this is effectively a WKB approximation to the klein gordon equation. And so both numerically and analytically, it can make it far more tractable than it is trying to solve um, you know, a full relativistic wave equation. Um, it's a very trendy equation. It describes um, axion or ultralight or fuzzy dark matter, depending on what you like to call it. Um, you know, so in these scenarios, galactic halos would be a Bose-Einstein condensate you know, from an axial mass of maybe 10 to the minus 21 eV. Um, it also shows they show up in um, you know, boson stars or axion stars. So there's a variety of circumstances where quantum matter um, can exist in the universe and where a variety of num number of groups, um, including my own group with uh, Jens Niemeyer's, uh, Kruik Gittingen and uh, colleagues at Yale, uh, developing solvers that, um, you know, that can address uh, the properties of this um, of this kind of matter. And so one of the things we can see is that the early in the post-inflationary universe, um, you can actually have local gravitational collapse. Um, and this would be for, before the process of reheating, before the process of baryogenesis, that would render the universe very inhomogeneous during the time that these um, you know that these processes were being developed. And so we've been able to, um, because this, this, um, this epoch is related um, to large scale structure, we've been able to adapt uh, large scale structure codes and adapt them to the behavior of the universe um, immediately after inflation. And so this is um, just an image uh, from work uh, done with uh, Benedict Egmeyer, uh, Jens Niemeyer's um, PhD student and Jens, uh, using the axionics code that we developed as applied um, uh, to the early universe and you see um actually we're using an in-body code rather not um and, and you can see that this um this blob here weighs about 20 kilograms so it's about as you know much as a medium-sized dog um and it lives in a space that's uh 10 to the minus 20 meters across and so we have this very very highly inhomogeneous universe and understanding the consequences of that um for the post-inflationary physics is something that um and is largely um, still an open question um, particularly if you're in a phase that's after um this um this you know studied or well-studied phase of um, parametric resonance so you can have a picture where inflation renders the universe perfectly smooth on on all scales then it um undergoes a period of um uh, essentially matter dominated expansion um, immediately after inflation that may last um, long enough for the universe to grow 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 times larger uh, then then um, you know that somehow gives way to the you know through the process of thermalization um, to render the early universe hot enough to you know to, to sustain a hot big bang and then rolls through into the present day uh, so we have um, you know this possibility of this almost entirely unexplored phase of complex nonlinear dynamics in the early universe. Um, so just as some closing thoughts, uh, I think early universe cosmology is at a turning point. Uh, gravitational wave constraints are putting really non-trivial limits on gut scale scenarios, which is awesome, but frustrating because we haven't seen any yet. Um, there's lots of novel, novel phenomenology in early universe cosmology that we're still digging into 40 years later. Um, gravitational waves um, are interesting ideas as possible signals of high frequency um, of new, new physics 
maybe connections with you know, the dark matter community, you know, very, very sensitive detectors on, on laboratory scales. Um, but I think there is a risk that um, cosmologists are becoming Aristotelians in, in some sense, and that we're doing extrapolation and not interpolation. We have effective field theory, we have GR, we assume that it works at all scales, um, but we're really, you know, sort of running on pure reason at this point. We have very few clues as to what to expect. And so in some sense, we're not so different from Aristotle um, looking out into the universe, um, you know, um, two and a half thousand years ago. So I think we should be um, careful about what we assume and what we, difference between what we assume and what we know. But these, these are interesting times to be around in the next 10 years is going to, um, is going to change the way uh, that we understand the early universe in, in one way or another. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much for this uh, enlightening talk, indeed. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. So we have time for questions. Uh, so I don't see, please, I mean, I encourage the participants to ask questions with the, with the virtual, uh, with the multiple virtual <laughs> environments of the conference. So um, I have uh, several ones, but I'll start with one. Okay, we don't have much time left, but um, uh, thinking about models that we already have, you already mentioned uh, actions, right? What about action inflation, right? I mean, so um, what's the, you mentioned uh, actions, right? And facilitar matter. So axions I mentioned primarily in the context of actually of, of, dark, yeah, of these dark yeah. matter models where you have these very light, um, yeah. physics. I mean, the, the axion inflation, I guess that's closest to natural inflation. So, you know, you have like a, like a very flat um, uh, potential. Um, I think, I mean, the, the, the inference seems to be that, that if it's, you know, if we're going to map inflation on um, to the kind of taxonomy of single field models, then it looks like we're, that somehow the, because the epsilon term is much smaller than the eta term, um, you know, which is what the data is telling us. I mean, at the moment, it's only a little bit smaller, but you could imagine, you know, if we're doing this 10 years from now, there could be you know, a couple of orders of magnitude between the two. Then it seems that whatever the potential we want, if we're writing it, if we're able to write it as a single, you know, minimally coupled scalar field, which is, you know, far from guaranteed, there's, you know, there's a whole raft of developments and brain world models, for instance, that I didn't talk about. Um, then if we can do that, then it has to be something, you know, we know the shape of the potential. The problem is, is we really only know one parameter, which is the slope the, 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 yeah. or the second derivative rather than the eta parameter. And so that, that in some sense is all we know, unless we've got some other characteristic feature of, you know, so, you know, there are some, there are models where you have, you know, um, modulations in the inflationary potential, for instance, um, or you have some, you know, distinctive um, physics that takes place after inflation, you know, developing, um, you know, a characteristic gravitational wave background or something like that, but it's ex it's extremely challenging to you know to test a whole you know family of models on the basis Ooh, of a single yeah. parameter, which is where we're at at the moment. Yeah, we have a question from Nicolao Fornengo now from the audience. Thank you very much. Which is uh, thank you for the very stimulating talk. Uh, how relevant is to measure the third derivative terms in the potential, and what are the prospects? So. Um, and I'm glad you asked that because yeah. that was the last thing I, that was the last thing I took out when I was trying to get my talk into the time limit. Um, I, I think I think the third, I mean the third, I, I have a paper with um, with um, Jonathan Pritchard and Peter Adshead and Harvey Loeb from 2011, um, and we actually look at that explicitly. And so I think the, the next, the one parameter that is kind of guaranteed to be non-zero is, is the running or the alpha parameter, it's sometimes called. Um, but you need to measure a very large volume of the universe in order to, um, to put meaningful constraints on that parameter. So there are argu generic arguments that, um, that the n, one minus n, that alpha is basically one minus n squared. So, so you know, maybe a few times 10 to the minus four, maybe 10 to the minus three if we're lucky or most, most likely negative in these simple models. And so that at the moment, that's about 10, we need to do about 10 times better um, or maybe maybe more in terms of our ability to measure alpha to be able to, to detect that parameter, um, you know, at the level that we expect it to be in typical inflationary models. So maybe the nature is kind of us and gives us, some, you know, a, a larger running that we might expect. If you 
want to construct models that produce black holes at small scales, then that might be um, something that you need to do, um, or you know, to, to make that happen. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it's um, it's definitely something to aim for, simply because we've actually, in some ways, it's much more likely that alpha is non-zero. We can be confident that alpha is non-zero in a way that we can't be confident that R is is, is measurably different from zero. But we we would be measuring most of the volume of the universe in, in order to um, in order to make that happen. I think it's better to say. But sooner or later we'll do that, and sooner or later that that number will tell us will be the, potentially the second number that tells us anything meaningful about the inflationary um, potential. Yeah, it's a great question. So thank you very much, Richard. We have another uh, another question, last one, uh, from Andres Sabuta. How can we differentiate gravitational waves from large object collisions, uh, black holes or neutron star black hole, for example, and from uh, cosmic inflation, which might be large lens? So, so I think I mean the question here comes down to the weight to the spectrum. Um, and so the inflationary background of gravitational waves, unlike the density perturbations, which you know the short wavelength ones have even been washed out by motion or they've gone on in there. So, so that the gravitational waves, if they're produced by inflation, they exist on every scale from the size of the universe, you know, down, down, down to the, you know, the size of our hands. Um, and so, so being able to, you know, if we see them in the microwave background, then we might hope to see them in a, you know, just psycho style experiment in the solar system. And those two scales, um, it will be very hard to take us, take a, you know, even a stochastic background from black hole collisions or, you know, binary white dwarfs, the kind of things that um, Lisa will see and produce those over, you know, 30 orders of magnitude between, um, um, you know, solar systems, well, not you know, between laboratory scales and, and, um, and cosmological scales. So it's really the, the spectral shape of the, um, you know, the fact that the stochastic background from inflation, the gravitational wave background will be featureless, but any other source we can think of is probably not. Sorry, that's a long answer. Okay, thank you very much, Richard, again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Especially for staying, staying awake until this time. <laughs> that's what he's saying. It's, it's a pleasure. I wouldn't, wouldn't have missed it for the world. I'm just, just sorry that I can't be there in person. Thank you very much for this great talk. And uh, let's go now to move to our second speaker uh, in this uh, cosmology plenary session. It's a honor to have today with us as a second as a second speaker, uh, Licha Verde from ICC uh, of the University of Barcelona, uh, and also from the ICREA organization. Uh, thank you very much, Licha, for accepting this talk, and thank you very much. She will tell us about what's going on with cosmology today. So, thank you, thank you, Licha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see if I can uh, share my screen correctly. Uh, share. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, perfect. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, Lita. Okay, so uh, well, thank you for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to talk about, you know, what's uh, what's up in cosmology. I know you maybe were waiting for a, a, a review, but I thought that uh, there's so much going on in cosmology that maybe some update of what has been going on over the past year or so. Uh, will be of interest uh, to this uh, to this audience. So first of all, um, it will. The cosmology uh, has seen and is seen a coordinated effort of uh, large collaborations uh, to go after the parameters of the model and, 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 and observe a lot of, uh, of the universe and extract uh, interesting physical information from there. Now for this talk, it will be too long to report all author's name and all the references for all the relevant collaboration. Every data release is several papers with long author list. Uh, so, uh, but you can take a look, for example, at the cosmology related chapters of the review of particle physics book by the particle data group, because all key reference and the later results are there and will be there in the 
uh, next edition that will be out in a, in a few months. So new results in the past year or so come from collaborations such as uh, KIDS, this is a uh, weak gravitational lensing collaboration, and, and DES, the Dark Energy Survey, the year three, the year one was out already, and from the EBOS, I would say a little bit more what they are later. And then there is uh, uh, the usual baseline point of reference uh, uh, of the cosmic microwave background. There is the, the Planck, uh, the Planck data release, the last data release was uh, Planck 2018. It still stands and is still extremely important. And you will see mentioned also the Atacama Cosmology Telescope results, which is a ground based. Uh, CMB, both temperature and polarization uh, experiment, and look at the smaller part of the sky and, and at a higher angular resolution. Uh, so we have seen this uh, this plot already. Uh, this plot this is there to remind us that uh, cosmology has an extremely successful standard model that describe, uh, as far as we can tell, the entire observable evolution of the universe over a range of scales and a uh, range of, uh, of time. And uh, we live in the era of precision cosmology, where this model with just six numbers can describe the universe composition and evolution. And there are several parameters describing both the homogeneous background and uh, the perturbation, although it leaves some questions open, like what's the origin of the uh, dark energy, what's the origin of cold dark matter, and what set up uh, the initial perturbation, although the, the previous talk actually uh, gave uh, a wonderful motivation of what set up the initial perturbations. So before I go on, let me mention that cosmology is special because we don't make experiment, we make only observations, and uh, we have to use the entire universe as a detector, but the detector is given and we can't tinker with it. And uh, this idea always go back to us, all great idea in cosmology to gene peoples. Um, so this bring in a mixed blessing. One is what I call is the course of cosmology because we only have one observable universe. We make observations and only of the observable universe and not the experiment. So basically we end up fitting models that is constraining numerical value of parameters to the observation. And therefore almost any statement is model dependent. And it's important down the road to actually ask when we say we measure the density of matter, or we measure the property of dark energy, or we measure the current expansion rate of the universe, how much of what we say it's cosmological model dependent and how much is not. But this is also uh, a blessing because, well, we cannot serve all there is to see. And this has motivated a huge observational effort. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning there are large collaboration because when there is a huge observational effort, you have to put uh, forces uh, together uh, to make this detector as big as possible. That is to observe basically all there is to see, which brings to the idea of an ultimate survey. If you observe all there is to see, there's no point to repeat the experiment because everything that there is to see has been observed already. And this is an example of an ultimate experiment. That's why we go back always to, to Planck. So this is the map of the cosmic microwave background temperature fluctuation by Planck, and that's the representation of the Planck satellite. But uh, there are also other experiments, uh, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, South Pole Telescope, and in the near future, as they've been mentioned already, there will be S4 and Simon Observatory. Uh, this is because uh, the map for the primary temperature anisotropy that Planck has provided, it's basically all there is to see. This, the, the, the map is cosmic variance dominated. So if one is only after the primary temperature anisotropy, that's it. Of course, if one is after spectral distortion or polarization or secondary effect, then that is not all there is to see. Um, the CMB has been uh, extremely successful to study cosmology. It gives it a snapshot of the photon baryon fluid R recombination, what you call the last scattering surface, some, sorry, one zero too much there, some 300,000 years after the Big Bang, and gives us a unique window into the early universe where the physics, it's 
simple, linear, and well understood. Uh, but uh, those wonderful maps, both in temperature and polarization, uh, get uh, get compressed and that co get compressed in angular power spectra. And we have seen that uh, you know the, the the line is not uh, is is uh, is a theoretical model. It does not connect the dots. So that tells you uh, the exquisite precision of both the measurement and the agreement between the theory and the data in the lambda CDM model. Uh, beyond the primary anisotropy, there are also secondary anisotropy. The one of interest for this audience are especially the integrated Sachs-Wolf and weak gravitational lensing, that is the imprint of the structure along the line of sight between the observer and the earliest light, which is the cosmic microwave background. So as I was saying, the primary CMP temperature fluctuation information content has been saturated. So the near future is larger scale structure. Of course, polarization information content has not been saturated and there's a lot of effort going on in that direction. Um, uh, so what the physical information larger scale structure include? Well, a lot from the clustering. Uh, one can ask questions about what are the constituents of matter, what's the physics of inflation, what's the neutrino mass, nature of dark matter. Uh, there are uh, there's uh, information that can be extracted about the geometry, which tell us about the expansion history of the universe and, and dark energy. There is some more information that I will explain in, for the non aficionado in a minute uh, about the growth of, uh, of perturbation. And one can extract also hints about homogeneity, non Gaussianity. And also, each of these, like the observer is at the center of this uh, here and looking out. Each of these dots is a galaxy, and uh, uh, the redshift of the distance goes in this direction. So you can imagine each of these dots is not just a position as an entire spectrum associated with it. So there's a heck of a lot of information. This is big data regime. And the spectral analysis gives uh, non-cosmological information, for example, about galaxy formation, but may be key to ensure robustness of everything else that is elongated up here. So uh, this is a plot to show you how the field of uh, galaxy ratio survey has been increasing lately. Ratio survey have been increasing by about a factor of 10 every 10 years. Of course, in a log log plot, everything looks like a line, but this is a quick summary of uh, where we have been and where we are going. And uh, the, the next uh, big project my, my group is, uh, for example, involved with is this uh, uh, DAISY, which started already, and the target is uh, 30 million uh, redshifts. So all this survey also provide not just a clustering of uh, galaxies, but also the Lyman Alpha Forest. And since there's one key result that uh, this audience may be interested in, let me explain quickly what the Lyman Alpha Forest is, although the next speaker is an expert on that. So, you know, <laughs> Matteo will be able to say much more about this. So uh, Quasar act as a background source for all the intergalactic medium that is between the observer and the quasar. So from the absorption line in the quasar spectrum, uh, we can reconstruct the clustering property of the intervening um, baryonic matter, but uh, distributed a little bit more uniformly than just uh, galaxies, as we've seen in galaxy clustering directly. Um, the other uh, big window into uh, the larger scale structure and the dark matter distribution is weak gravitational lensing. The first detection of weak gravitational lensing was uh, in the year 2000, but since then the field has exploded. And the news this year have been the dark energy survey year three results that have been released and the kids collaboration 1000 uh, square degrees in the sky. So the idea is that the background, light from background objects, galaxies, 
like it happened for the lensing of the cosmic microwave background, like of a background the galaxy get distorted by all the intervening mass in front. And therefore, uh, their shape gets slightly distorted and their alignment gets slightly distorted. And by doing this over uh, a big number of galaxies and detecting the coordinated statistical property of this distortion, then this approach uh, it's extremely powerful in constraining a combination of cosmological parameter, which is the amplitude of the perturbations at the observer shift or uh, normalized today is the famous sigma-8 parameter and uh, omega matter, which is the matter density parameter. Uh, I would like also to mention that it's not that the larger scale structure and CMB are seen as two completely different probes, because of course there is the same universe intervening between them, and so there are cross correlation. So cross correlation has been uh, uh, announced for a very long time. Uh, I took this plot from the Planck collaboration from the first uh, uh, release, where the CMB lensing signal has been correlated with galaxy tracers because the same tracers that lens the CMB are the tracers seen by the various survey and the agreement between the theory and the data is spectacular. Um, from the ad collaboration, this is Planck plus ACT cross correlated with uh, uh, red luminous galaxies from the BOSS collaboration. Again, a wonderful agreement. But in this plot, here is some new result from this year where the just the lensing CMB signal, not the lenses extracted in cross correlation, just the pure lensing extracted CMB signal has been cross correlated with the lensing signal from the larger scale structure. And there is a detection there also of, uh, of that. And I thought it would be interesting. It's not, in terms of parameter constraints, it's not really powerful, although this, this one is, but as a wonderful consistency check that it all hangs together, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So uh, spectroscopic galaxy survey, the latest result are from the EBOS collaboration from, from uh, January before the state of the art was the BOS, part also of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, BOS data release 12, and the next on the horizon is uh, DESI. And this plot shows, uh, again, where the observer is here looking out in age or in redshift, uh, the progress in filling uh, both the redshift range and the density of object between e between the boss and and the e boss result. These are the e boss result. And these are the boss result. So um, two philosophy to constrain cosmology from galaxy survey. Let me explain what they are, because I think it's important to understand uh, what follows. Uh, the first philosophy, which is the one more widely used today, is what is called baryonic acoustic oscillation and baryonic acoustic oscillation plus space distortion. And to just say it in less words, it's say compression. So first, what are baryon acoustic oscillations? Baryon acoustic oscillation is basically seeing the same physics as we've seen in the oscillation of uh, the power spectrum of uh, the cosmic microwave background temperature fluctuation. But instead of seeing it in the photons, we now see them in the dark matter where they have been printed by the baryons that were coupled to the photons <laughs> at when the CMB perturbation were actually imprinted in the last scattering surface. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a nice consistency check in the sense that the cosmic microwave background and the physics of the early universe uh, lay down a standard ruler. And we can see the standard ruler both in the CMB and in the later time clustering of objects. So early time physics sets this standard ruler and galaxy clustering then measure the angle basically that this ruler subtends. So the signal is the angular location of this uh, uh, BAO. And in this methodology, not the amplitude, just the location. So this can tell us information about the expansion history, but not the normalization of the expansion history. In other words, it cannot give H naught because one only measures angles. However, it can give H naught once one takes early time physics information and data, 
to actually set the length of the standard ruler, the famous or infamous uh, RS or uh, sound horizon radiation drag. So this plot shows uh, the EBOS uh, power, uh, baryonic acoustic oscillation in the power spectrum, where in order to see them, well, it has been divided by a power spectrum without oscillation because these are small, these are a few percent. And the same in this plot, but in the correlation function where this is a peak rather than some acoustic oscillations. So this uh, for the BAO. And RS RSD stands for Rashi space distortions. This is because peculiar velocity that are sourced by the, by the gravitational pool of inhomogeneities um, distort the maps. And so if one measures redshift and interpret redshift as, as a distance, then uh, the clustering gets distorted in an, an isotropic way with respect to the line of sight. And these are the reported result for the growth of structure, because this uh, signal measures the growth of structure from the EBOS uh, collaboration. So the growth of structure is in reasonable agreement with the prediction from a Planck lambda CDM model. This uh, approach measures uh, growth of structure, as I say, which is usually reported by the combination of sig sigma eight, which I mentioned before, and this F is uh, the linear growth rate of perturbation. But there is a different philosophy that one can also use and to say, well, let's do like we do for the cosmic microwave background, just pick a model and then fit the anisotropic power spectrum of the observed clustering. Uh, the difference from the CMB is that in the CMB case, there is no anisotropic power spectrum because it's 2D and there are no redshift space distortion. And here, this can be done at several different redshift and in 3D. Um, so this approach has become increasingly popular lately because it's uh, computationally more, uh, in, uh, more expensive. The first approach is said to be more model independent because it constrains physical quantity rather than parameters of the model, like expansion history and growth history, and then from there one extract constraint on the model. An approach to is a bit more computationally expensive and obviously more model dependent because one each time has to pick a model and constrain the parameter of the model, but gives better constraint. So this puzzle uh, me and my group for a while, and uh, uh, it turns out uh, uh, that uh, the difference in the information content between the both approaches, it's uh, mostly the behavior of the matter transfer function turnaround, that is the details of the expansion history around the matter radiation equality, and to a smaller extent, uh, the amplitude of the baryon acoustic oscillation, which the other technique uh, doesn't, doesn't use. Now, all the results that I will show from now on will not use approach number two, we we'll use approach number one. So recent constraints, some update that may be of interest to this audience is on neutrino mass, dark energy, and the amplitude of perturbation and H0. And I will be qualitative because uh, there are many numbers. Uh, and uh, if you want a, a specific number, there are always the references there. So I'm preaching to the converted, so I will go quickly here. The physical effect of neutrino masses is that uh, total masses above about one EV become non-relativistic before recombination and can be constrained by the CMB primary. Total mass below one EV become non-relativistic after recombination. It also utters ma master radiation equality, but the effect can be canceled by, by the CMB degeneracy. However, uh, since the finite neutrino masses suppress the matter power spectrum because on scales smaller than the free streaming length, there's some additional signature in a larger scale structure. So if one keeps fixed uh, the physical density of matter, physical density of baryon and omega lambda, then this is well, the well-known plot that shows that if one increases the neutrino mass, there is a suppression on small scales of the matter power spectrum in, uh, in linear theory. Also different masses become non-relativistic at slightly different times. So if one has got enough statistical power to study this part of the spectrum, maybe one can get some information about the neutrino mass here. 
Now this, however, uh, one, when one consider CMB data, one tends to move more along a CMB uh, parameter degeneracy rather than keeping fix this uh, combination of cosmological parameter. And so if one instead move along the CMB degeneracy, then those lines that are reported here become more like this. So you see there is an overall suppression of amplitude and some effect at the BAO scale, but is uh, less drastic than the one we saw before. And again, reality is somewhere in between, of course, because the CMB degeneracy is not perfect and because the CMB degeneracy is not aligned and is not infinite. So here we are, what are the lighted constraints where there are still three neutrinos and they are light. So the constraint of the number of affected neutrino species as in, as in change much, it's still very well consistent with the, with the prediction. Uh, but the error bars don't change much, even if one uh, allow a cosmological model that is not a lambda CDM, but a lambda CDM plus 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 with many other parameters free, the constraint, don't, the, the error bar don't, don't uh, uh, degrade. Uh, there are interesting uh, news on the sum of the masses. So this is uh, a compilation and there's a lot too, too much probably to take in in only one go, but I want you to call to concentrate on the first two lines, it's CMB only. It, it's better than, than one EV because there's, a lens, there's some lensing information in there. Uh, once one add uh, expansion history from the baryon acoustic oscillation signal, one get at a limit of 0.13. If one add the Rashi space distortion, it gets 0.1, 95% uh, confidence limit. And if one add the Lyman alpha, then the constraints become almost 0.09. And this has consequences. So if I put this constraint in this plot, uh, this is uh, CMB, primary Planck only, I add the BAO, and then if I add the larger scale structure in Lyman alpha, then we are here. And that's one implication <laughs> of this uh, limit if we believe the constraint of the Lyman alpha forest. Uh, and, uh, and the other constraint is here, yeah, I took a, a relatively old plot and I put on top the, the latest constraint, the 0.1 constraint and the 0.09 constraint here. So these are implications for tritium beta decay, and these are the implications for neutrino less uh, double beta decay for uh, the two hierarchies. So let me move on. Uh, dark energy is not going away. Dark energy has effect on the expansion history, as we've seen from supernovae that led to the, dis the discovery of uh, dark energy, but also growth of structure. So let's uh, recap. The CMB test, is, uh, test geometry and the integrated expansion history to the last scattering surface and some growth via the lensing signal. Uh, baryon acoustic oscillation test uh, directly the expansion history, while Rashi space distortion test the growth, although uh, there's some information about uh, expansion history in the growth here also because of uh, the angle and the, and the distances. And uh, gravitational lenses measure both, is sensitive to both in an intertwined way. So here are the results from the EBOS uh, in the omega matter equation of state uh, parameter for dark energy from cosmic microwave background, adding uh, Rashi space distortion and adding uh, CMB and weak uh, lensing and weak lensing. And here instead is the constraint from the expansion history alone, not from the growth of structure. And it's nice to see that the two constraints are uh, uh, in agreement with each other. And the DES collaboration went beyond that and put everything together. So this is a little bit of a busy plot. The lensing DES results are in gray. Uh, BAO Rashi space distortion plus supernovae is in orange. The green is cosmic microwave background signal without the lensing. And uh, everything together, it's the purple 
when CMB lengthening is also added becomes the blue. So dark energy is not going away and is still well consistent with an equation of state, which is the same of a cosmological constant. It's very hard to get rid of dark matter. And there were a couple of papers this year that I think will be of interest. So the first one I want to mention is the uh, Spergel and Pardo. So what they do, they measure uh, the baryon power spectra and the baryon transfer function just by looking directly at the observations of uh, the cosmic microwave background and a late time um, uh, um, and, and then uh, and then a later time. And so with uh, SDSS data and uh, the CMB with the with the polarization. And so you can see here, that their measurement of the baryonic power spectrum as these oscillations, which are in good agreement with the theory prediction from CAMP, the standard uh, Boltzmann codes, with, uh, which assume that there is dark matter there. And this is the corresponding uh, baryon transfer function. So if one wants to get rid of dark matter and invoke an alternative theory of gravity, this alternative theory of gravity becomes contrived because it must provide oscillations, which we know are an, a, a signature, a, a peculiar effect of, of dark matter. So this is on very large scales. We can go to smaller scales. And it was noted uh, again during this past year that there are dwarf galaxies uh, that are dark matter dominated, and there are dwarf galaxies that appear to be without dark matter. And they don't look too different to you and to me and to anybody. Look at them. There's one example of each. There are 19 of those. There are many more of these. So any alternative theory of gravity must explain both. And there's no correlation with any of the other property, not with the size, not with the mass. So in a cold dark matter model, lambda CDM type, these are relatively easy to, 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 to explain. These are being some tidal stripping and therefore the dark matter is somewhere else and we see the baryon displaced and that's what we see. While this hasn't happened and therefore there is the dark matter is aligned with the baryonic matter. But in any alternative model of gravity, this becomes a little bit contrived. So you can ask what about primordial black holes and the latest, uh, it's a review that came out in late 2020 by Karen Cannell, where they put together all the constraints from several different sources and find four windows. Although if we want primordial black hole to be the, all the dark matter, there are only two windows remain, either very small, this is lunar size, or very, very big, this is galaxy and cluster size. But in their paper, they say that this window actually it's, it's this favor for many other considerations. So they can still be invoked, for example, at, uh, at this in this window here to explain some of the gravitational uh, waves signal, but they cannot be all of the dark matter. So what's up with sigma-8? So you may have heard that, that uh, in the past few years, sigma-8, which is the amplitude of the perturbation at redshift zero on a scale of eight megaparsecs, but it's a parameter for the amplitude of perturbation at late time, uh, has been acting up in the sense that in a lambda CDM model, the low redshift universe seems to prefer a lower value of sigma-8 than the one predicted from the CMB observation. And this is a summary of what is the state of the art uh, uh, today with the release uh, both of KIDS 1000 and uh, DESI uh, and the DES uh, and the DES collaboration. So uh, precision and accuracy in the measurement has increased over the past uh, two, three years, but the tensions have remained the same. Uh, it is about two sigma for each experiment. For my supreme income, it's uh, less, it's about one sigma, but for uh, DES and kids, it's about two sigma. Uh, but there's, there's more than one survey. And there's also some indication from the lensing of SDSS that it's, uh, that it's uh, lower. But uh, it's not clear that one can combine all these two sigma together and say we got uh, four or five sigmas. But now let's come to the other question that you may have, which is what's up with H naught? 
So a couple of months ago, there was a, a overall review by the Valentino et al of uh, all the different uh, measurements. So let me just uh, show a simplified uh, plot, uh, plot of this. Uh, but that shows that there are basically two camps. One is the camp of the early time physics, CMB or early time physics based, that seems to be hovering around 68. And the other one is the camp of the low redshift universe that seems to occupy the camp around 73, 74, with something here in the middle, which is called uh, uh, tip of the red giant branch. So all this relation tend to be calibrated on cephates. This is calibrated on a, on a different way to measure distances, which is the uh, tip of the red giant branch in uh, nearby uh, globular clusters. Um, so this was not a problem until around, uh, you know, 2014, 2015, uh, but uh, has been a problem since then. And uh, so, and I find this particularly interesting because with all this observation, we have been building a cosmic distance ladder. The traditional cosmic distance ladder was going from here up to a redshift passing through um, parallaxes and then cephates and then supernovae and then cosmological supernovae. Uh, but now we're being able to extend the ladder thanks to the baryonic acoustic oscillation all the way to the earliest uh, light of the universe back and forth because now we can calibrate the baryonic acoustic oscillation on the standard ruler given by the CMB, overlap with the supernovae and go back all the way to redshift zero. And this is where the two, when we realize as a community that the two directions don't quite match. Uh, so what has been going on lately is that uh, the community have been asking a lot of questions and trying to find some answer. There are more quest more open questions than answers, but uh, let me give you some answer that seems to be more or less the consensus. First, is it a problem? Well, it depends how you combine your data, but it uh, can be between four and six sigma. So at this point, it is a problem. One cannot swipe it under the carpet. Then the next question is, where is the problem? Is it systematic? So at the beginning, everybody thought it was a question of systematics, but then the data have been published. Uh, in the independent group have repeated the analysis and the results don't quite budge. So that dump systematic seems to be increasingly unlikely. Maybe it is systematic, but it's not uh, you know, a, a, a dumb one. And it's definitely not in the CMB data for sometimes people were blaming it on Planck, but now uh, the same happened also taking completely away CMB data, still relying on early time physics, of course, but taking completely out of the equation CMB data. So if the problem is not in the data, then one can ask, is the problem in the model? And then once you ask if the problem is in the model, you need to ask yourself, uh, do I mess around with pre-recombination physics or post-recombination physics? Uh, it's appealing uh, to uh, play around with post-recombination physics because it's the pre-recombination physics is the one we know and love and that we believe we understand. Uh, but post-recombination doesn't seem to fix the, to fit the problem, or at least nobody has come up with anything that actually works. And uh, and changing and messing around with the property of dark energy doesn't help. And pre-recombination, you need to change uh, the sound horizon or uh, the uh, radiation drag. You need to change the standard ruler, so which is uh, a little difficult to do. For a while, this was interpreted in terms of early versus late. Uh, it turns out that the, the technique of the tip of the red giant branch agrees with CMB, while the technique that uh, disagree and has the smallest error bar is cephate based. Uh, but the relative distance ladder between the two approaches agree. Is the calibration that doesn't agree. And the, the cephate based is now based on Gaia parallaxis, while uh, the TRGB doesn't. And so at this point, to figure out why the two low redshift determination don't agree, they also, again, need to agree in their calibration. So the next Gaia release will really help actually nailing this down, because it will be able to give distances to, um, uh, to 
to to to cephades that that uh, that that are in nearby enough ob, uh, galaxies so that there can be supernovae and then the ladder can be extended without ma making any approximation. So uh, conclusions: the concordance vanilla lambda CDM still rules. There are some puzzles. Uh, H not and then to a lesser extent sigma eight. There is, there has been, and there will increase a coordinated effort by large collaborations to move on from precision cosmology to accurate cosmology. The field has moved well beyond spherical cows and pie in the sky. If you read the paper, it's impressive how many uh, checks and cross checks and blinding and test of systematics uh, and reanalysis has been done. The CMB was very appealing uh, initially. It was a simple physics. It was simple to analyze. That's why cosmology started making an impact beyond the field of astro, but also you know, in a community li like yours. Uh, now the game has changed because as the error bar shrink, then everything needs to be uh, under exquisite control and hence this uh, effort. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisha. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this talk. Thank you. Uh, there was a question that I'll pass through the forum because uh, we are running a bit late for the next uh, thing, okay? But I'll pass it to the forum, Lisha, okay? You can answer it there, okay? Okay. Question, okay. No, no problem. Thank you, thank you. So um, I'll remind the participants that the, this session will be closed now because uh, we have to make this with the next speakers. And then um, uh, you just need to reconnect to the very same link, okay? So no, there is no change in the link or nothing. Same link will work, but the session will close and you will have to reconnect using the same link, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, Licha. I'll pass the question to the forum, okay? Thank you. She will reply uh, the, the question from uh, Jose Boch in the forum. Okay, ah, you, you are already typing an answer. Okay. No, no, this guy, I do it through the forum. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Licha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.